There's just a little bit more I wanted to tell you about hearts themselves as a part of a cardiovascular system. I wanted to review the concept of a heart attack. Uh, the term heart attack, that is not a medical term. However, when doctors say that a patient has had or is having a heart attack, they very often are referring to this condition known as a myocardial infarction. Myocardial infarction, the cool kids call it an MI. That's what you'll hear on the TV shows. There's an MI, uh, M for myocardial, I for infarction. And what does that mean? Well, the medical term, you can break it down. Myocardial means there's something wrong with the heart muscle, myocardium. And infarction, infarction is a medical term that means that the that cells are dying because the supply of blood has been cut off. So that's what a myocardial infarction is. Um, the most common cause of myocardial infarction is a problem called atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis, you could call hardening of the arteries, but it also includes um, fat buildup inside of the arteries. Let's dive into that a little bit deeper. First of all, um, let me remind you that even though the ventricles of this guy, the heart, even though those ventricles are filled with blood, the blood that is inside those chambers, the ventricles and the atria, it does not actually supply oxygen efficiently to the muscle of the heart. So those chambers of the heart could be filled with blood that has got plenty of oxygen in it, but it will not um, supply oxygen to the cells of that beating heart. Uh, the blood that goes to the heart needs to come through these red blood vessels, the coronary arteries, the coronary arteries. And we remember that the coronary arteries, they uh, branch off of the aorta immediately distal to um, the aortic valve. Um, so now, uh, luckily, uh, a cat, uh, luckily, uh, every little chunk of muscle tissue is generally being supplied with uh, oxygenated blood from two different arteries. So for example, this artery is supplying blood to here, but this artery could also supply blood to this area here. That is because the heart has evolved in a way that's pretty clever. The heart knows that if people live long enough, one of those arteries is going to have less blood uh, supplying uh, the chambers. And so um, it needs to have a backup plan. Um, so every little part of the heart. Now, uh, a myocardial infarction. A myocardial infarction happens when there is an obstruction, you could think of it as a clog, happens in one of these coronary arteries. Uh, so the coronary arteries um, are pipes that are delivering oxygenated blood. If they get obstructed, no blood goes there, no blood goes there, no oxygen goes there, no oxygen goes there, cells are gonna die, right? So here, I've got more pictures though. Here is a picture of an obstructed coronary artery. Uh, we see the one on the top, this is a healthy coronary artery, the one on the bottom, not healthy. Uh, and this allows me to explain to you that uh, that buildup of fat inside of our arteries, that buildup of fat inside of the arteries is not where you think it is. Uh, well, it's not where I ever thought it was. I think when I thought of fat building up in our arteries because of what we ate, I thought that it was building up like right here. And I thought to myself, well, why can't doctors just go in and like scoop it out, right? You know, it's kind of like a roto-rooter, except, you know, for heart arteries. There's a reason why. So this little curly layer right here that I'm outlining, that little curly layer, that is the endothelium. So that's the inner lining of this structure, the artery. Um, however, uh, the fat is not sitting right there. The fat is being deposited in there. Why is it being deposited in there? Yeah, we don't know that. Um, but we do know that my cat wants me to put her up on her bed. Oh. There we go. Sorry. 
So the reason that you can't scoop it out is because it's not here where you could scoop it out. It's in here. How did it get there? Yeah, well, that's one of those things we're still trying to figure out. We're, one of the many weird things is this kind of heart problem that humans have, dogs don't get it, cats don't get it, but okay, there's one breed of dog that has been known to, to have this problem, uh, but just one breed and out of all the dogs on the planet, wolves don't get it, lions don't get it, um, but humans, humans do. I want you to know the symptoms of a heart attack. Most people, when you tell them, oh, someone's having a heart attack, they get this picture from watching TV shows, right? Where it's usually a man and he's gonna grab his chest and he's in a lot of pain and it's a lot of pressure. Maybe there's pain going down his arm. Yes, that is one, of, one set of symptoms that can be found with a heart attack. When it comes to heart attacks, uh, more than 50% of men that have heart attacks will have what are known as classic symptoms. Uh, pressure on the chest, uh, difficulty breathing, sweating, very often nausea, like feeling like they're going to throw up, um, and pain going down the left arm. Um, however, fewer than 50% of women that have heart attacks will have those same symptoms. Um, they are, have the non-classic symptoms. I want you to know those too. When uh, your aunt might have a heart attack, she might wake up in the morning more tired than she has ever been before in her life. She thinks she's coming down with the flu. And she slept wrong on her neck. Oh my goodness, her neck is really, really stiff or sore. Or she might think she's got a bad tooth because her jaw hurts. Um, um, and she's nauseated, she can't hold anything down and she's sweating, but she doesn't have a fever. Uh, notice that with your aunt and these non-classical symptoms, there isn't necessarily any pain or pressure in the chest, and there's not necessarily any pain going down the left arm. I want you to know all of those symptoms. And remember that if you ever are, are treating a patient in an emergency room, and it's a woman or a guy, and they've got symptoms that seem like they could be the stomach flu, but with some kind of pain in the neck or jaw, you should work them up, uh, at least check them to see if there's evidence that they're having a heart attack. Now, uh, one more thing about um, atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis can cause heart attacks, but it can also cause strokes. It can cause an obstruction of Let's go backwards. It can cause an obstruction of the coronary arteries, but it can also cause an obstruction of arteries taking blood to your brain, and that will cause a stroke. Um, atherosclerosis can also uh, cause obstructions of the arteries that are taking blood down to your legs and can lead to this burning pain in your feet. And one of the points that I like to make, because your Uncle Joe can be very stubborn about not taking care of his heart health, um, the artery going to a man's favorite part of his body can also get obstructed this way. And this problem, atherosclerosis, is the number one cause of impotence in men. And uh, it is the reason why particularly men that have type 2 diabetes have got uh, nearly a 50% chance of being impotent. So atherosclerosis can cause impotence, which is properly known as erectile dysfunction. Right. Uh, we know we don't know everything about why this kind of problem happens or how to make it happen less often. We do know that diets that are high in animal fat, like full fat meats or um, full fat dairy, that those things are making heart attacks much more likely. So a vegetarian diet. Um, almost always is going to be better for your heart health. Um, it also is why you should care about your blood cholesterol levels. And if your blood cholesterol levels are too high, and if you can't bring it down by moderating your diet, or you just plain don't feel like changing your diet, there are medications to bring your cholesterol levels down and decrease the risk that you will develop a heart attack or heck, impotence, both good. So one question, what part of the central nervous system directly regulates your heart? 
And the answer to that is, go ahead, pause, check your notes. What's the answer? It is, oops, sorry. It is the medulla oblongata. The medulla oblongata is, is sending commands to your heart through the autonomic nervous system, both sympathetic and parasympathetic. So let's keep on moving along. Let's talk about the difference between arteries and veins. What's the difference? Oh, hopefully in 150, they drilled it into you that the difference is not oxygen saturation. Uh, yes, it's true. Almost all of the arteries in our body have got lots of oxygen and very little carbon dioxide. Almost all the arteries of the body, lots of oxygen, not much carbon dioxide. However, there's one set of arteries where everything is backwards. Those are the pulmonary arteries. The pulmonary arteries are low in oxygen, high in carbon dioxide, and the pulmonary veins are backwards too, right? So let's look at this. Here's our pulmonary artery. It's got blue blood in it. Blue blood in it is low in oxygen, high in CO2. Why? Because it's being sent out to the lungs where it will pick up oxygen and drop off CO2. We talked about that in our last series of lectures. So the difference between arteries and veins is not oxygen saturation. And as I probably said earlier, when I was sitting in those chairs, I was like, get over yourselves. Let's just call them veins. I'm tired of having to remember this. There's a good reason why we don't call these blood vessels veins, even though they carry blue blood. And that is because arteries and veins have got very different structures because they're undergoing very different stretches, uh, stresses. This blood vessel, the pulmonary trunk with the pulmonary arteries, it is receiving from the right ventricle this surge of blood. This big old surge of blood is going out into the uh, pulmonary trunk, right? And so that artery needs to be strong because the pressure goes up inside of it. And so it not only needs to be strong enough to not pop when that happens, but it needs to be able to stretch to allow uh, the artery to uh, um, transfer some of the kinetic energy into potential energy. And then when the ventricle goes through its, its diastole, then the artery can snap back and smooth out uh, the difference in pressure between systolic and diastolic. That all happens in arteries. Um, the blood pressure inside of arteries let's not talk about the pulmonary trunk, but in the systemic circulation, blood pressure can go up to 120 and then down to 60 or whatever, right? And that's when you've got normal blood pressure, 120 millimeters of mercury. Um, if you've got high blood pressure, your blood pressure might go up to 180 millimeters of mercury, right? That is a lot of pressure. Now, here we've got our aorta, this is going to be the abdominal vena cava. This, the diameter of the abdominal vena cava is the same as the diameter of the aorta. If you saw them side by side, they're the same sizes. But how much pressure is inside of here? Inside of the abdominal vena cava, which is a very large blood vessel, the blood pressure is not 120 or 70. It's certainly not 180. It's like five. Five. So in order to make an artery, you need to make a tough, stretchy material, like some kind of super stretchy fire hose kind of thing. Whereas in order to make uh, even the vena cava, what do you need? Uh, a hefty bag, okay? Hefty bag's gonna do it because it doesn't have much pressure inside of it. Alrighty, we are going to pick up there at the beginning of the next video.